we're watching data on screen. Watching the data on screen. There we go. Okay. Yay. Now we can see people. Okay. Tyrone, are we good to start? We are good to go. Okay. So we're just using the cadence that you shared, right? Yep. That's Okay, so uh, uh, welcome everybody. This is uh, an information session for the MA in Global Security Studies. And I uh, want to welcome you. And uh, I'm John Wilson. I'm a professor of spatial sciences, sociology, architecture, population, public health sciences, computer science, and civil and environmental engineering. Uh, it's a lot of titles, unfortunately. Uh, uh, I'm not very smart, I just work hard. Uh, and most of my work is around uh, topics like geographic information science and spatial analysis, and increasingly about sustainability and community resilience, and for that matter, community engagement. So uh, uh, I, I'm here because I direct the Spatial Sciences Institute, and, and we are the administrator of this particular program and one of the contributors. Uh, so what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, talk, talk about why global security studies, why USC, and then uh, we're going to introduce the faculty, say something about the curriculum and then the admissions process, and then we'll take questions. So I think, Steve, at this point, I hand it over to you. Okay. Um, sorry not to be down there, guys. I, I'm, I'm fighting. Uh, I, I'm teaching security, but I can't uh, beat the uh, Trojan check. Um, <laughs> So uh, not wanting to get shot by snipers in one of the parking structures, I, I decided to do this online. So I, I apologize for that. Uh, my name is Stephen Lammy. I'm a professor of international relations and spatial sciences and environmental studies. Um, I'm semi-retired, but uh, am still involved in, in this particular project, which I started about five years ago. Uh, and that's how long it took to go through this. And we, uh, chose to land in spatial sciences, and you should know this, and some of you may already do that, because of essentially the innovative leadership there. Uh, this is a fantastic program, a fantastic department uh, that doesn't say no, uh, and basically is supportive of, of programs of high quality. And they've done a great job sort of putting this together and sponsoring this. And I want to single out Professor Wilson, but also Susan Kamei, who's sitting there, who's done just a fantastic uh, job on this. Let me say a little, we're gonna talk about why global security studies, or why USC, the faculty, curriculum, admissions, and then I'll answer your questions as, as Professor Wilson just said. Um, the first thing in terms of why global studies, why security studies, it's very obvious. I've been in this field, teaching in this field for about 40 years. And it's very obviously that we, we can't really compete with some of the schools back East because of their location in DC, et cetera. So how do you essentially create a program uh, that allows you to take advantage of what's at USC? So in our field, there is a bit of literature called the Copenhagen School of, Interna of, of International Security, which offers what they call a widening approach or a wider approach of the notion of what security is. This is a much more interdisciplinary approach. It's not just all guns and rockets. It's also about human security. Uh, and now we have a partner here in Sho the Shoah Foundation and also environmental security. So what we tried to do is combine three different views of security and policy questions in those three baskets, those three tranches, if you will, in terms of, of security. So we're going to do traditional security, et cetera. And I know my colleague, uh, Greg Treverton, who's a major player in this, this area is going to play a role there and other faculty at USC who are well prepared to deal with sort of some of the traditional security questions. We also have uh, partners, as I said, in the Shoah Foundation that deal with human security. Human security defined by many, um, it's very popular in European uh, universities as well as Canada and Australia, et cetera. But human, human security is freedom from fear, freedom from want and the rule of law. 
Uh, and so the idea basically, and it deals with humanitarian intervention and issues like that. And show is going to be our partner in terms of that issue. And some of us, I, I teach a course on, you, on uh, humanitarian intervention. And so they'll be part of that. We also have partners with the, with the environmental studies and the Wrigley Institute uh, in terms of environmental issues. Uh, and we'll be working with them as well. Uh, and then in terms of essentially the methodology, as well as the content, spatial science has, has basically had a human security focus for a number of years. And they're doing amazing work in this area because many of the um, agencies in Washington, not just the military, but the military being one, but others are using the, the whole spatial science methodology uh, in their particular approach. We're going to have other connections in this program as well, which, uh, we're, which we have already cemented. I just spent yesterday talking to colleagues at the Free University uh, in Brussels that we've been working with before, who have connections with NATO and the European Union uh, for internship uh, possibilities, et cetera. And they, they are excited to get involved in this particular project. They've actually been, we've been discussing this with them for a number of years. And they were glad to hear that we were back online uh, with this. The other, of course, is we have um, potential for travel courses. Uh, for five years, I took 18 students to the Arctic to deal with the impact of climate change on economics, politics, security, et cetera. We all know now that the Arctic is an area that of, of, of rather um, critical security importance because of climate change but also because of the, the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we have two, uh, we have a lot of colleagues there that we could work with, but one is something called the Kalata Academy, which is a, an academy of graduate students from the, not, the eight countries that are part of the Arctic Council. Uh, and they travel together across the Arctic and give papers, et cetera. And we've been invited to be part of that particular program as well. So that's just a very brief overview that I can, uh, and I can answer any questions related to that of what we're trying to, um, to do. Um, so again, the YUSC, now I think I turn it over, Susan, to John in terms of the value of spatial sciences. Yep, thank you, Steve. So I, I'm just gonna say a couple of things about spatial sciences and then hand it over to Amy. So spatial sciences is essentially about space and place. So where things are, why they're important, uh, what's their current status and so forth. And uh, unfortunately, with the events of the last four to six weeks, uh, we, we see this in, in action every single day. And so these two images are from uh, this, the port city in, in the Ukraine and the buildings before the Russians attacked and the, and the remains on the right is what's left after that. Uh, and this is unprecedented because uh, you know, we live in this age of big data, lots of big data are geospatially organized, uh, including all kinds of satellite imagery. Satellite imagery used to be the exclusive purview of governments. Now, most data is collected by the private sector. And the US administration, uh, Biden's administration, has taken the unprecedented step of taking things before that were probably classified and kept behind closed doors, and basically is encouraging people to distribute them across the globe. And you know we've, we're beginning to see this in North Africa and other places where perhaps the drivers are climate rather than two countries attack one country attacking a neighbor. So uh, basically what we bring then is, uh, is uh, data and the ability to use data to frame arguments, to find solutions, to document uh, atrocities, et cetera, et cetera. So spatial sciences, uh, has instituted its name, but it's uh, it's a one of a kind institute because, uh, among other things, we host and operate our own academic programs. Uh, it was established uh, a little less than twelve years ago. Uh, today, it has twelve what I call core faculty. They are interdisciplinary. Uh, there are thirty nine faculty affiliates. These this group is supported by nine staff, of which Susan is the lead. Uh, we're in the Alan Hancock Foundation building in the middle of campus. We uh, have faculty and staff offices on a sort of a sub-basement floor. And above us, there are two uh, state-of-the-art teaching spaces that are now modeled after the den classrooms that the Viterbi, Engin Viterbi School of Engineering pioneered some time ago. We actually run 18 academic programs. As Steve said, 
We have a human security and geospatial intelligence minor. We have a human security and geospatial intelligence bachelor of science degree. Uh, we have a graduate certificate in geospatial intelligence, a master's degree in human security and geospatial intelligence, as well as a lot of other things. And so uh, the global security studies uh, degree that, that we're talking about today is, is really a, a nice complement, an extension of what we were already doing. Uh, we have a substantial research enterprise uh, that's, uh, that's mainly collaborative, it's global, uh, and it, it brings uh, the kinds of science that people like me do to bear on real world problems. And I do that by collaborating with people like Steve and, and others across the globe. And, and to support that, we have a large computing infrastructure. Uh, we do things uh, at the service scale. We do things on a laptop or a, or a pad or a phone. Uh, and increasingly, the, the kind of computing with the global scholars will need will be you know, on the edge, meaning that you might collect data with your phone and do some computation with your phone and maybe send some data back for work on a server and bring it back. But, but the, these are gonna, these have changed the way we think about our work and how to document what's happening on the planet. Uh, but this, this has only just begun, it will continue. So with that, I'll hand it over to Amy. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm here to kind of represent one of the partners in the program, the USC Shoah Foundation. Um, we have an archive of 55,000 testimonies of genocide survivors that was founded by Steven Spielberg in 1994 after he made the film Schindler's List. It started as um, an effort to document the story of the Holocaust before the survivors, while, we, while there was still time. And has since expanded to include um, Armenian genocide witnesses and survivors, um, Cambodian genocide, South Sudan, um, more recently the Rinja in Myanmar. And, um, victims of contemporary anti-Semitism. So it's a sort of, you know, an archive of pain and suffering in a way, but really the, the human impact of security issues. Um, and Steve mentioned that he for many years taught a class about um, the Arctic. Uh, I, a couple of years in a row, took students to Rwanda and we have lots of context. The photo you're seeing on the slide right now is in Guatemala where we have some really interesting partners who are pictured here, actually. That's the, um, the director of the FAFG. It's like the Anthropological Foundation, um, sorry, Forensic Anthropology Foundation of Guatemala. Um, and they, their work, is, they, they came to testimony kind of incidentally doing forensic anthropology unearthing mass graves and came to us to help them understand what to do with all the stuff they had. Um, and so they started taking testimonies to help them with their mass grave work and kind of adopted our methodology. Um, and now we have um, a bunch of testimonies from, from Guatemala as well. So um, my kind of background is really human security, it, like I think, you know, the, kind of, I don't know, the, bed, the gravest example of human security, right? Genocide is, is, is a target did for extinction. Um, and talking about using Rwanda as an example of how a society moves on. So Professor Wilson talked about resilience and how people, you know, kind of bounce back, but um, rebuilding society after genocide um, and using testimony and understanding the human impact of that was a key component of that, of that course. Um, we do work with, you know, I talked about our Guatemalan partner. We have partners, a lot, a lot of partnerships in around the world. Um, Rwanda is obviously a big one for us. Um, actually, just this week, I haven't even told Steve this yet, but was speaking with somebody in the Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs in Rwanda as a potential um, partner on this program. Mm. So we have lots of really interesting and exciting internship opportunities that, that we bring to the table from UNESCO and European partners in you know, continental Europe to partners in Africa and Guatemala. Um, and, and really kind of grounding it in this, you know, as we we're saying interdisciplinarity, like bringing in different viewpoints and perspectives and understanding the human impact of security issues. Okay, so I think it's back to me for a second. So what, what we've tried to do then with these different uh, academic units at USC is to pull together 
uh, this powerful faculty that, that uh, complement one another and that bring unique perspectives and, and skills and talents to, to, a, to a modern day sort of global securities uh, program. So Amy has just spoken, so I don't need to say I don't think anything more about her. Uh, so two more faculty from uh, international relations, Robert English, uh, who's uh, an expert on uh, Russia, uh, among other things, and Jeffrey Fields, who's an associate professor of the practice of international relations and the director of the USC Dawnside Washington DC program. Uh, and he has expertise and experience and obviously American uh, foreign policy and diplomacy, international security, all the things we're interested in. And then we switch uh, to David uh, Ginsburg, very fine person, uh, professor of environmental studies, uh, who's interested in the organization and dynamics of natural communities and marine ecology. And you might be thinking, well, how does that connect with what we're doing here? Uh, many of the, of, the, of the touch points for the lack of security and so forth in the world uh, increasingly are driven by environmental uh, drivers and concerns, uh, issues around sustainability, resilience, carrying capacity, and uh, these perspectives are going to become more and more important. And to Steve's point about the Arctic, uh, you know, it's 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 likely in in our lifetimes, particularly the students in this program's lifetimes, that the Arctic will be will be traversed by marine shipping, and so suddenly the connections between Northern Europe and and North America and parts of Asia will become dramatically shorter, closer than they have been throughout much of modern history. So another person is Lloyd Boyd Judson, uh, CEO and co-chair of the Oxford Initiative for Global Ethics and Human Rights and the executive director of the Women's Narratives Project. So again, global rights are front and center, moral diplomacy. So uh, another very important perspective. Uh, Steve has, is a distinguished scholar and, and and teacher, and he's already uh, spoken. Uh, two of my colleagues, Laura Leola uh, is an assistant professor. Uh, she, she teaches uh, around topics in spatial analysis and modeling, behavioral ecology and conservation. And she's done a lot of work with uh, behavioral ecology and conservation in parts of Africa, for example. Darren Riddell is an associate professor, uh, and soon to be director of graduate studies in spatial sciences. And his work's around urban sustainability, resilience, human environmental interaction. And, and he has experience in the Peace Corps uh, as a volunteer in Cameroon. And in the middle of the slide is Padima uh, Pittick, who's the head of research services again in the USC Shoah Foundation, uh, and her work is an interest organized around music, memory, and politics. So super important as well. It's a long list. And then Steve uh, Spurlo, Associate Professor of the Practice of Political Science and International Relations, again, a focus on human rights, US foreign policy, the former Soviet Union and uh, a former senior Central Asia researcher at Human, Human Rights Watch. And then another of my colleagues, Elizabeth Sedano, uh, has both a geography PhD and a law degree, uh, and is interested in spatial analysis and modeling in urban geography. And remember, uh, most of the planet's citizens now live in urban areas. And I won't introduce Greg Trevenin, uh, fine scholar and, and person that he is, because he's going to speak uh, uh, directly after Steve describes the curriculum and I need to say nothing more about myself. So Steve, the floor is yours again. Okay, um, thank you so much, John. Um, what, just throwing a lot at you and that sort of stuff. So we'll have time for questions. Basically it is a nine course, 40 unit, five semester program. Um, every program is adaptable, et cetera, but the courses are not going to be change much. In other words, start classes will start, uh, a, a group, a cohort will start in the fall. We'll have two courses there. Uh, the basic course, Foundations of Global Security, I'm actually going to be teaching that, which will sort of introduce you to sort of the, the languages and approaches to global security uh, in, um, in the world. Not, you know, obviously, this is, is going to be somewhat theoretical, but very policy relevant, but it'll provide you with the tools that you can use in future courses. The concepts in spatial thinking is the, is the, the basic core course for spatial sciences. Uh, in the spring, we'll have security and global governance. Um, and, and that is the idea of looking, it's not global government for those of you who are worried that we're trying to you know, promote some sort of um, 
ideological perspective, it's governance. Uh, and one of the critical issues we're facing in the world today is the lack of governance. My colleague, Gordon Brown, who teaches here once in a while, uh, who actually wants to address the program next October, um, is, is always talks about ungoverned territory in terms of policy, but also in terms of governance. Uh, and then there'll be a, another spatial science course on human security and disaster management. Uh, and th that is going to, that, those courses, those four courses are gonna give you a firm foundation for the second year. What we have in the summer, and we're still working out some details on that is a global security practicum. Uh, and part of that has to do with a sort of a problem solving uh, approach to which was what we're trying to emphasize here. This is going to be a curriculum that emphasizes active learning. That's what spatial science is all about, is active learning, not a bunch of PowerPoint presentations as we're doing, uh, but uh, basically the idea of actually getting your hands involved. And we're gonna do a lot of case studies and problem-based learning exercises uh, in, this, in, in, this, in this first year to introduce you to that that particular aspect. We're also gonna be taking advantage of our alumni network and bringing them in in terms of Zoom calls since we're all used to that now. They'll be coming in as speakers. Sometimes basically they'll be live, but most of the time the people in Washington and other, elsewhere around the world will be um, actually uh, brought into classes to speak, et cetera. Uh, for example, I just set up a, a relationship with a guy named Thomas Kruger who works in the State Department. He's actually calls himself the industrial, he's been called the industrial assassin because he's in charge of basically the economic uh, sanctions against Russia. Uh, he's the one that's working on that for the State Department. And he's agreed to come in to speak about economic sanctions and what they mean in terms of security issues, so on and so forth. Okay, year two. Um, this is where you make your choice of concentration in terms of intelligence and security. Uh, or global security, humanitarian intervention, or environmental security. Uh, the idea basically is that um, we, we think it's, it's wise, and your advisor will probably say it's wise to really develop strength in one particular area. It's not necessarily required. I mean, if you want to make a case to be, um, you know, to look at two different areas, something like that can be worked out. There'll be a lot of individual choice involved in this, but we have to make sure we, you get the, the, the concentration approach. In terms of future uh, positioning and, and, and future jobs, it might be better to be have a strong, deep uh, understanding of, of a particular area. Uh, and then in the spring, the final semester is a human, sort of a, an end course is human impact of genocide and mass violence and a remote sensing for GIS course. Uh, and in, in that case, the, the, uh, there's not a final exam, but the, what there is is a policy paper or policy uh, position paper uh, that is essentially an MA thesis in that particular case, but not in a traditional sense, it's very policy oriented. Thank you. So yes, great pleasure now to introduce Greg uh, Triverton. Do you agree? Um, great to be with you. I'm in, in Nashville at the International Studies Association, but happy to be with you by Zoom. I'm excited about this program. It's, uh, it's, it's long overdue and see was worked hard to make it happen. Let me just echo all the things he said about how happy we are that it's at the Institute for Spatial Sciences, um, given its innovation and its focus, it, it's, a, it's a natural and a great place to have it. I've, uh, I've been, um, broadening the definition of security most of my career. Uh, I've worked in many more traditional security places like the NSC staff and been twice at the National Intelligence Council, but there too, we've worked on a broad range of issues. Uh, when I was just after the fall of communism, I was at the Council on Foreign Relations and I was uh, starting to put together a program that I wanted to call Global Security. My uh, board chair at the time was Jim Schlesinger, the former defense secretary. And he insisted, this is early 1990s, that uh, security had to be defined against something and for someone. So he said global security, at least in his view in the 1990s, could only be about uh, asteroids or aliens. Uh, my guess is even Jim would change his, have changed his view by now. And uh, by 2004 or so, when I was running a Center for Global Risk and Security at the RAND Corporation, 
uh, we did a little exercise asking, putting threats in buckets. One was nuisance, one was serious, and one was existential. In 2004, we put terrorism in the nuisance bucket. Probably the rest of the world wouldn't have, or less the United States wouldn't have, but we did. But the only thing in the existential bucket was pandemics. Uh, um, that's been on my mind ever since. I was just <laughs> revisiting a paper I did about a dozen years ago, which was a lot about uh, pandemics and existential threats. So um, broadening our, the aperture of security has been very much on my mind throughout. <clears throat> I'm happy to do the intelligence and security concentration uh, in the global security thing, but I certainly am interested in the whole range of things that uh, are possible for uh, students to get into in the program. Let me stop there, John. And, uh, look right. Thank you. So, Steve, I think you volunteered to talk about admissions. Uh, what were the admissions criteria here? We're very interested in getting some, uh, you know, what, what's not on that little list is, is excitement and, and people who are really interested in this field. But um, we're going to be flexible with it, but we think you'll be best succeed in the program if you have an undergraduate degree in the social sciences or related field. That doesn't basically say you cannot apply if you've got. Um, you know, a, a BA degree in, say, English or, say, say, in anything in the humanities. It just says, we think you have a better chance to succeed if you have these particular uh, majors, but we're open to about anything. One of the things we do think is that uh, at least a 3.0 grad uh, GPA is, is, is important. Uh, this is a graduate degree, and it's going to be um, demanding in many ways. Uh, and so we think if you've shown that you can get a 3.0, uh, if you go to Harvard, that 3.0 because of great inflation is probably a 7.0, but uh, essentially a 3.0 works, works well. Uh, we need one letter of recommendation from an academic reference uh, who can speak to your abilities in this kind of a program. Uh, I just read a letter from a, a former a colleague of mine who wrote for one of the students who's applying for the program. And he did a good job addressing sort of this sort of multidisciplinary degree program. Uh, you should also have a statement of purpose. Um, you know, this is not something that uh, you, you write and say, I'm, I'm taking this degree because, or I'm applying for this degree because I have nothing else to do. You really should talk about how your future fits into what this degree is about uh, and how you think you would benefit from participating in this degree program and how you think you could actually contribute to this as a student, uh, because we see this as a reciprocal arrangement between student and faculty and that, that, uh, that essentially help the degree grow, but also help us both learn in the class, all, everyone learn in the classroom. And then a CV and resume uh, or resume would be important to have as well of what you've done, et cetera. Um, and then the USC requires, if you're an international student, TOEFL and all these other little acronyms here, scores is required by the graduate program. Uh, you can send in a writing sample or a portfolio of your work. That's optional, but we're, we're, we'd love to read it if you think that that's going to help you. Uh, maybe it might explain a deficiency in somewhere else. Uh, so anything you want to throw at us, that's fine. Who's doing this one? I think Steve, you can keep. You can but, keep going. I think. Well, yeah. I mean, if that we have approved, Susan has has had this approved by the university that uh, if you are getting a BA in political science, BA in international relations, environmental studies, or human security and geospatial intelligence, you're able to apply uh, to the progressive degree path uh, of the program. That's basically what I think you need to say. And. Uh, July 15th, 2022 is, is the drop dead deadline for uh, applications uh, and the, uh, the address to send everything in is up there on the, on the board. And last is questions and my favorite picture of Steve. <laughs> now, this is back when I controlled the world. <laughs> <laughs> or at least thought you did. Yeah, or at least I did, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so questions. We have one question. person sitting in the room with us here, Steve. <laughs> so maybe we could start with a question from her. 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. First off, thank you um, for letting me listen in to this. I really yeah. appreciate it. Uh, for Professor Wilson, for, yes. did you say that you already have a master's in human security and geo geospatial intelligence? Yes, we do. What would be is the difference between the global securities program and that? Just that it combines all four of the other institutions as well, or how would those two programs? Oh, that's a good question. That is yes. a good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, so. I think the human security and geospatial intelligence degree is tilted more towards geospatial intelligence. So there's there are classes in there about uh, geospatial intelligence, tradecraft. Uh, there are classes though that are about problem solving, and there's probably a deeper uh, a, a deeper look at some of the spatial analysis and visualization tools uh, because. You know, if, if you've if you've got that kind of focus, the the lead sort of federal agency is the National Geospatial Intelligence uh, Agency NGA, and you know they 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 make extensive use of both classified and now open source uh, geospatial data, and and how how to use how to use all of those things are front and center in that program. Uh, here uh, we, we have some of the same opportunities. But it's really, at least the way I've thought about it, is that it's about you being a consumer of the products. Whereas in the first degree, you asked me about, you could actually be the, the author of the topics, okay. right? As well as a consumer. As a prize for being in person, you get three gifts. <laughs> Thank you. You get two gifts of paper. Now, if I could respond to Darcy, one of the things is that what I always like to tell undergraduates you should you should have a substantive major that talks about facts and, and information about a particular content area, and then you should have a tool uh, or you know or methods uh, uh, major. And so I think what this does is, as John suggested, this is really heavy on the content of the field, and then the application of these of these questions, et cetera, is done through geospatial uh, sciences. Thank you. Other, other questions from either Darcy or the online audience? The, the other thing I could say about there are other methods that are going to be introduced here. So, yes. for example, I study foreign policy using an interpretivist approach, which is all about belief systems. Uh, and we're learning a lot about how important belief systems are as we look at the choices that Putin makes every single day. But I mean, so it's a different, there, it's, there's not just going to be quantitative approaches, there's going to be qualitative approaches introduced as well. So it's not going to be just oriented toward one. And certainly the testimony work uh, that Amy has been doing and taking students to Rwanda, et cetera. Uh, and before that, uh, Shoah took people to Cambodia. Uh, th th that's more of a qualitative approach in terms of testimony. So there's a variety of methodologies introduced that you could work, you could use in the workplace if you go on from this degree to work in Washington D.C. or other places around the world. Yeah, along those lines, you could think of spatial as context. Okay. Yeah. Right. So something happens, and 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 in what situation, and what place did it happen, and what's the what's the context? Right. And, and change I, over time. And change over time. I have lots of conversations with colleagues from Shoah about, well, could we better understand the context? They, in terms of the Holocaust, they they had to look backwards, but increasingly, in some of the examples even Amy used, that they're working in real time. So they are looking at the present and looking forward. Yeah, and, and predictive. Yeah. So all of these things eventually just come together. They complement one another. They're not they're not substitutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the 1990s, we lost an opportunity to have basically John's program uh, at that time was morphing into other things from geography. And we were actually exploring the idea of bringing geography into the School of International Relations uh, right. and, and at that particular time. So th 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 these are not disparate fields. I mean, they're very close in terms of the kinds of issues they look at. Hiran, are there any questions in the chat we could share with others here? Uh, no questions in the chat. Okay.
you have any more questions? I think you covered most of them in the thing. Um, maybe about, you talked about a lot of active case studies. Would that be like, what would be an example of that? Like looking up whether or not to intervene in a situation or you don't know that quite at the moment? I don't know. That's, that's Steve's expertise. Yeah, yeah there'll be, uh, we'll be looking at case studies, you know, contemporary as well as historical case studies to look at. I mean, one of the big things that both Greg and I are uh, very familiar with and we use a lot is analogical reasoning. Uh, and the idea basically is to look at analogs, previous cases that we're looking at is, and then apply them to, to current issues as well. Uh, Ariel, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, um, I'm, I'm particularly curious. I mean, first of all, I really admire the integrative approach that you have presented. Uh, I think that's so sorely needed in almost every um, academic discipline. My, my questions are, could you be more precise in terms of defining what are the objectives of a program such as this? And I'm particularly interested in the human security um, major. Uh, and then following on from that, what are the tools that a graduate from the program would have ingested to enable them to be effective in some field of work that, uh, that um, uh, applies to that issue? Great questions. Um, uh, Greg, you want to take, take part of that? <laughs> happy to take part of it. <clears throat> um, but you, since you're the father of this, maybe you should start with the. Uh... Well, I think I'm. I, first of all, thank you for the the compliment about the interdisciplinarity of the program. I mean, I think that's one of the key things. Uh, we, we we looked at this and said security. You know, as many people have said this afternoon, is a broader thing than just looking at the military and uh, uh, and traditional way of looking at security. It's not just about war and violence and, and, and deterrence, et cetera. There's a lot of other issues. Human security in particular is becoming important as we deal with a lot of the crises that we face in terms of human crises, not just the pandemic, but poverty, uh, failed states, those kinds of things that come in. And the notion of humanitarian intervention, what does that mean? And so particularly in, influenced by uh, the 2005 attempt to create a global response with responsibility to protect. And so the idea basically was here you finally have a document that everyone agreed to, but nobody's applied. <laughs> but the idea is that R2P is something in the, the globe. So the global community is still wrestling with this notion of how do we respond? Because the, the basic barrier is this notion of sovereignty. So we're going to be exploring some of the, the critical big questions about <laughs> sovereignty and intervention and what that particular means, that, that means. And, and so those are the, the bigger question in human security. And then you have organizations like SHOA that are gathering testimony of people who have been victims themselves and have seen uh, basically the, the, the disasters and the damage being done by states and other actors uh, you know, toward human beings. And so we'll be exploring those as well. So it's really going to be a case it's going to be very much involved in cases and case approach. It's in the, the tools of understanding history, uh, which is it, it, under the current presidency is back in vogue to understand history. Uh, and, and the idea basically to understand, you know, how we, we've looked at the world in the past. The other skills are going to be the methodological skills, the qualitative skills, the tools that we can use to understand these particular issues. We hope that people will be introduced to a variety of players or actors, not just nation states. So the idea basically is that non-state actors are important. Global civil society is important, not just NGOs, but global civil society and global movements in particular, but also at the subnational level, ethnic groups and, uh, are important, et cetera. So we'll be introducing them to a real wide perspective in terms of this, uh, of, of this particular issue. One case that I will be using in my class um, is called Blessed Are the Peacemakers, which looks at Senator John Danforth's efforts to be a peacemaker in, in South Sudan. So th those kinds of th things. So we'll be looking at cases that allow students to see how the world, what we think, how the world really works in this case. Greg? 
Yeah, let me just pick that up. <clears throat> One of the things that strikes me about our current international system, if it can be called that, is it really uh, doesn't reflect the reality of today. It was really created after World War II and it's been tinkered with a little bit, um, but hasn't changed dramatically. And you, I recall being in a deputies committee meeting at the end of the Obama administration, and we were talking about partnerships and alliances and some, um, somebody, I think it was me, uh, had the temerity to say, but what about the private sector, the private sector, since we mean both the nonprofit sector and the, the for-profit sector. <clears throat> and everybody said, oh yeah, yeah, really important. But then two minutes later, we were back in the same sort of intergovernmental conversation that we've been conducting. And certainly intergovernmental relations are, are critical and will continue to be. But when you think about our world and civil society is so important in so many places where the NGOs are important, where the Gates Foundation spends more on health than Africa than the World Health Organization. I dare say that Google is in some sense more important than pick your country, Spain as an international actor. Uh, and so trying to um, open our minds and our possibilities and make people uh, fluent and really working across these unusual divides now, we've, we've, we've tended to think of things as sort of public private my guess is in 20 years, we'll look back on our current use of the terms public and private and think, gosh, that was kind of quaint. Uh, in any case, trying to imagine how you build coalitions across civil society actors and governments and major corporate stakeholders, that seems to me to be a, a key skill we'd like people to come away with, at least a sensitivity of that, and maybe some at least, uh, at least experience through cases and looking at it. I too do most of my teaching through cases, not really searching for analogs, but sometimes doing that, but mostly trying to see what lessons we can learn or should learn from particular past cases as we think about the changing future. I would just add, because Ariel brought up specifically kind of like, you know, what is the professional trajectory? I'm paraphrasing yeah. your question um, <clears throat> for somebody who does this program. And, um, you know, one of the things that the program emphasizes is hands-on experience. So I evoked a couple of our partners, like one of the reasons why we're interested in partnering on this and why I think the this constellation of um, spatial sciences and um, IR and us is fruitful is because we each have different contexts that we bring to the table. So I, you know, kind of threw out UNESCO and the United Nations and, um, you know, NGOs in various countries where we do work, but I know that the other partners have different contexts too. And so having like getting the students into real world situations, like not just case studies in class, but you are in an internship with this organization and helping them figure out this issue related to security somehow, I think is um, quite unique. Um, and given that it is integrated into the program um, and it's something that I wish, you know, I, could have had as a student. <laughs> Ariel, do we answer all your questions? Um, to a degree, uh, a follow up to, to that is what I've heard so far has been discussion about um, myriad institutions, human institutions. Um, I'm sort of curious about whether there is a, a thread in any of the curriculum that seeks to explore the individual human dimension. In other words, how does the microcosm of a single human being and what their belief system may or may not be and to what extent they may be open to being flexible about respecting other belief systems, to what extent does that sort of approach become expanded to a macrocosm? Because it seems to me that human beings try so hard all the time to create systems that will bring about human security. But what happens time and time again is that human beings who are prey to their own fundamental tendencies, game the system, corrupt it, defile it. So a psychological and a spiritual element to all this, and I'm curious about whether that any of that is addressed within the um, 
within the curriculum? Um, I, you know, uh, you know, I, I could give you an answer that, you know, is a typical academic answer, you know, hold an issue at arm's length forever uh, and not answer your question. Uh, but I, I think, I think the main thing I would say is that we hope that that kind of discussion will emerge from an introductory course, for example. Like, you know, I know I'm, I'm working on my course and I'm doing a lot in terms of um, the, the, the importance of history and the importance of narratives. Uh, and especially as we talk about things like colonization and things like that and the narrative justifying colonization and decolonization and how that contributes to the human security problems today and that sort of thing. So one would hope that the response to that reading in that, in that week is your question. Uh, and so I don't have an answer to your question, but I think that's exactly the kind of question we hope our students will ask. Absolutely. <clears throat> thank you. I haven't made it forward, but again, thank you guys. This is like an absolutely incredible program. So thank you. Thank you. She's one of my research assistants, Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> so you've already converted her, which is good. There's a question on uh, Susan that you might want to answer that's on there from Alexis. Hey, Alexis, I went ahead and answered that question. Uh, okay. A little bit of a lengthy answer, but uh, essentially there's a couple of things you need to check off first to determine if you have eligibility. Uh, just a face value being a senior that's that's what you're you're already you you technically you already meet the at least six having 64 units um you'll need to work with your major uh advisor to make sure that they give you an updated course plan and then you can email uh our academics program director monica pan attach your updated course plan there for her and she'll take a look at how that fits into your expected graduation date um, and that kind of determines whether you would do a progressive degree path or just, you know, graduate and apply as a traditional graduate student. So I am, uh, I'm graduating in six weeks. So I guess the question is more, should I be meeting with my advisor to try and put together a PDP application now, or should I just apply in like the traditional application path? So since you're graduating at the end of the semester, that PDP would not be an, would not make sense for you. You would you would be looking into um, applying as a traditional graduate student. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and in any case, if you're looking to apply, you do not want to delay it because this program is only fall admissions only. And so you would have to wait another year uh, to apply if you if if you don't apply for this cycle. Any more questions from anybody in the audience? I just want to go back to one of Ariel's questions that I don't think we, Amy started to answer it. We are going to, in this program, have parallel programming in terms of speakers, et cetera, and using the USC alumni network very effectively. Um, you know, I've already, as I had talked about earlier, I've identified four speakers already have agreed to come in in the fall and talk. One is the assistant to the president of the IRC, the International Rescue Committee, who is a graduate of us and went to Woodrow Wilson School for his MA. Uh, and then I mentioned the guys from the State Department that are working on the export control uh, aspect of thing and they're willing. So we're gonna do you know, all three sectors. It's kind of what we call a tri-sector approach, uh, public, um, private and not-for-profit sector, global civil society. We'll be emphasizing that as well. And yesterday, or two days ago, Gordon Brown said he would gladly come and talk to the, to the class. So uh, he'll be here in October um, and, and teaching, a, a, you know, and he basically said, I could, I could bring the class, whatever the size of the class is, I could bring it to his, to his lectures if I wanted to. It's kind of neat to listen to the guy who was ran the UK for a couple of years. <laughs> uh, Steve, Steve, is he, he he's coming to campus? 
Yeah, you usually have the course. It's a two-unit course in the spring, but he wants to, to launch it in the fall now, and he's going to be on campus in October. Excellent. That'll be good. Yep. Yeah. Got it. Um, Alexis, I went ahead and typed up more information there for you in the chat. Uh, if, if you decide to move forward applying to the program, um, since you're a current USC student now, uh, I, I send you the link in there as well. You would qualify for uh, the student fee waiver for the application to be waived. Um, and then you wouldn't need to submit transcripts already as you know, USC, you're applying to a USC program within USC. So we would have those transcripts as well. Thank you so much. Uh, jump on that, Alexis. USC not wanting money. Geez, that's that's a rare occurrence. <laughs> Got to take advantage of it when I can. Yeah, yeah it's really. <laughs> throw, throw your body on that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, you know where to find us. Uh, we have uh, a web page. I think Damon has put it into the chat um, on the program. Uh, you've got. Uh, the, mo the most important person to be able to help facilitate the admissions process is, is, is Daron. Uh, and uh, the rest of us are happy to answer any questions about the curriculum or uh, how, to, how to find out about getting to meet Gordon Brown. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> right. Thank, uh, you. thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so Greg. much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Hey, have a safe trip Thank back. You. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, guys.